everybody. Glad you're here. You notice a sign on the door every week. Ruth and I check the health unit to see what the new rules are for churches, if there are any new ones. And unfortunately, this week there was a new one, and they want us to keep masked the whole time now, even when we're sitting. Ruth and I, as long as we are 12 feet away from you, which I think once we're up here, we're okay, we can take our masks off so you can understand what we're saying instead of just hearing more through the microphone in our mask. But uh, yeah, so that's the rules that they put in place. If you've got any health reasons why you can't wear a mask, obviously feel free to take it off. But um, we are working hard to obey the rules so that we can keep meeting together. And so let's just pray together to open our service. Father, I thank you for bringing each and every one of us here today. Thank you, Lord, that we're not here by accident, that you have a reason and a purpose for calling us here this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to open our ears and open our minds and our hearts to what you'd have to say to us. Lord, please forgive us for the things we've done this week that have hurt others, hurt ourselves, and hurt you. Forgive us, Lord, for the things that we've failed to do that we should have done. Cleanse our hearts, Lord, cleanse our minds, and prepare us to hear from you so that we can leave this place in some way changed, leave this place in some way closer to you. Thank you for each person that's here. And we just pray for your, your blessing to fall upon each of us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue some of our adventures in sign language this morning, looking at some passages from Psalm 136. And we are we're stepping it up this week, and we are going to learn a whole sentence. Not just a word, not just a bit of grammar, a whole sentence. All right? Now, this is a sentence that is probably going to be familiar to you. That one. No, previous slide there, Nathaniel. That one right there. We can stay right there for a few minutes. His love endures forever. We begin with the word his. And uh, just any, any possessive pronoun like that in sign language is the same for his or her or their. It's just like that. Just a gesture towards the person that you're talking about. So his. Because God is a person. It's his. God is not an impersonal force. He's not karma. He's not yin and yang. He's a person. And this is his love two fists crossed across your chest the strength and the closeness of love his love and one thing that we know about god although we can't really understand it is that he is infinitely patient with us and with his creation and i know that eventually he's going to call time and we are going to see the fulfillment of all the promises that he has made but he continues he endures he keeps going so he continues. This two thumbs together, moving forward, continues. His love continues or endures. And forever is a big circle, great big circle, because it just goes on and on and on without end. His love endures forever. So as we read through Psalm 136 together, that phrase keeps coming back because the one who, person who wrote this psalm just kept bringing it back as an emphasis and bringing it back and bringing it back. His love endures forever. So every time that comes up in the readings that'll be on the screen, one verse per slide, let's, let's speak it both out loud and in sign language. So we begin with, give thanks to the Lord of Lords. His love endures forever. He alone does great wonders. His love endures forever. He made the heavens with unsurpassed skill. His love endures forever. He spread the land on the waters. His love endures forever. He made the great lights. His love endures forever. The sun to rule the day. His 
love endures forever, and the moon and the stars to rule by night. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. Amen. Well done. Thanks.
Exodus chapter 33, starting to read at verse 12. You have Bibles there, so you can follow along if you want. Exodus chapter 33. It's on page 140. Page 140, Exodus chapter 33. My version might be slightly different. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name and have, found, and have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then, then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Father, thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for the stories and the meaning in them, the, the truth in them, and how they can apply to our lives today. I pray, Lord, that you would show us what you want us to see, what you want us to, to learn this day. Lord, please give me the strength to do this. Take this time, it's yours. Do whatever you'd want with it. In Jesus' name, amen. So our passage this morning finds Moses in one of his favorite places. It's a place where scripture says that he talked with God as a friend talks to a friend. A place that's so holy and special that everyone knew when Moses was meeting with God there, because a pillar of cloud would descend upon the tent of meeting, upon their meeting place, as God and Moses spoke with each other. It's a place where Moses needed to go when he had reached the end of his rope, when he was so frustrated with the people that God had called him to lead. A, a place where he needed to go to experience God all over again. A place where he asked God Almighty, show me your glory. Now, we looked at a frustrating experience in Moses' life last week, an experience that likely brought him to the end of his rope where, when it came to dealing with these Israelites. He'd been chosen to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery, and God accomplished that in many different miraculous ways, and, and he had led the Israelites into the desert to begin their journey to the land that God had promised them. And he provided for them again in miraculous ways. He provided food for them every day, for their journey. And yet, as we saw last week, when Moses was called by God to ascend Mount Sinai and, and to receive God's laws for his people, and, and when Moses, you know, took a long time, a lot longer than people expected to come back down from the mountain, the people got impatient. They actually got rebellious. And they convinced Aaron, who was Moses' brother, who Moses had left in charge, they convinced them, yeah, your, your brother's gone. He's not coming back. Make us a new God for us to follow. And so Aaron gathered together all the gold jewelry, and he made this golden calf that we talked about again last week. And they, and they declared that this calf was the God that had led them out of Egypt, which is actually kind of mind-boggling because they, they just made it. They saw it being made, and they were led out of Egypt months earlier. And they had experienced the power and the protection of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But, but these people were impatient, and they were stubborn, and they wanted things done their way. 
And when the unexpected happened, they turned away from God. So when Moses returned from the mountain, he found the people having this drunken party in celebration of their new God, the golden calf. And he was frustrated with them. He was angry with them. He took the two tablets that God had written the laws down for, for the Israelites, and he just smashed them on the ground. And he melted the calf down into powder. He tossed the powder into the water supply, and he made the Israelites drink it. And the next day, Moses went before God to seek forgiveness on behalf of the people. Incredibly, he even offered to take the punishment. God, whatever punishment you're going to give to these people, give it to me instead. But God said that he would punish those who were guilty in due time and that he wanted Moses to continue to lead the people to the promised land. God instructed Moses to lead the people to that place that God had promised them. But, that he, but God said, but I won't go with you. God said that the people were too stiff-necked, they were too stubborn, they were too unwilling to listen. God said, I, I, you go, but I'm not going to go with you. Which brings us to the passage and the Moses story that we're looking at this week, where he meets with God in the tent of meeting, the place where he speaks with God as a man speaks with a friend. And in this place of honest sharing, Moses expresses his frustration with the situation. He is frustrated with the people who will not listen, but he is also, to be honest, a bit frustrated with God. God had instructed him to lead the people of Israel, but in the intervening time, God had, not, had given him very little further instruction and details about where they were going. Sometimes God only gives us what we need to know when we need to know it, and in our human frailties, that can be frustrating, and it was frustrating for Moses. And God responded that he, Moses, I know you by name. And that he says to Moses, Moses, you have found favor with me. So Moses responds, if I have found favor in your eyes, God, teach me your ways, that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. And God answers him by saying, my peace, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Now, now this is different from what God had said before. He had just finished saying, I'm not going to go with you, with your people. But now he says to Moses, his peace will go with Moses. A different response to a different attitude. The people were stiff-necked, stubborn, rebellious. They refused to listen. They were intent on doing things their own way. And God, in essence, was saying, okay, well, if that's what you want, have it your way. But Moses approached God with a totally different heart. He said, I want to know you. Lord, I want you to be pleased with me. Lord, teach me your ways. Moses showed himself to be teachable. He came before God with a spirit that was willing to listen and willing to learn, a spirit that was willing to obey. And in response to that spirit, God said, I will go with you. Sometimes we wonder why God might seem distant from us. We wonder, why can't we sense him near? Why can't we hear his voice? Why can't we figure out what it is he wants us to do? Now, there are times that he allows a distance for a time in order to teach us things that we need to learn. But more often than not, the absence of his presence that we feel, even though he's still there, but we feel the absence of his presence, can be traced back to the attitude with which we approach God. If we approach him with a stubborn attitude, a demanding attitude, one unwilling to listen or to obey, one where we, we want to do our own thing, and, and we fool ourselves by asking God, can you bless this, even though we know it's our own thing, then in all likelihood, it'll be tough for us to, to sense his presence in our lives. But if, like Moses, we're teachable, we're willing to listen, we're willing to learn, willing to obey, then we will sense God's presence again. He will give us the peace and the rest we need in the midst of our stresses and difficulties and, and will lead us into plans that he has promised us that will give us a hope and a future beyond anything we could have imagined. Now Moses still didn't have a lot of detail as to what God had planned. All he had to go on was he was assured that God would be with him. And so it is at times in our lives. The way ahead may not seem very clear. And all we have to go on, all we have to go on is that God is with us. And because he knows us completely, because he sees everything completely, because he loves us completely, that's enough to go on. We can trust in him, trust his goodness, 
And based on that, we can step out in faith. Now Moses had received word from God that his presence would not go with him and with the people of Israel. Yet Moses still seems to feel he has to make a further argument to convince God. He says, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? If your presence doesn't go with us, he says, how will anyone know that we are your people? How will anyone see us as different from anyone else unless you're with us, Lord? If you don't go with us, don't send us, he says. The same conversation, the same questions can be put forward in talking about the church and talking about God's people. If God's presence is not here, if this is not a place where we know we can come and experience God, if there is not a sense that God is walking with us, then don't send us from here. Why move forward? Why have services? Why do any of the things that we do? Without the presence of God, we, the church, are indistinguishable from any other organization that might do good in the community. We're just like the Lions Club or the Rotary Club or the Kinsmen. These are all great groups. But when, what makes the difference for us as a church is the presence of God. His presence must be here. His presence must be welcomed. We must welcome him. We must want to meet God and experience God here. We must know and live out the fact that because of God's presence in our church, because of God's presence in our lives, we have found a different way to live. Society will tell us there's one way to live. Our human hearts and desires will tell us that, well, this is how you should live. But God asks us to live differently. There is a different way to live than what we've experienced, than what the world has told us. There is a different way, the way we were created by God to live. A way that's not easy, but a way which brings fulfillment. And when people see us living a different way of life, they will be taken aback. Some may not have realized there is a different, better, and better way to live. Some have just been so and wrapped in their own bubble, they don't realize that God has a different way for them to live. Some will be taken aback at somebody who's actually swimming against the current. I remember in, in our youth drop-in years ago, we, our, one of our volunteers brought in this poster, and it's a picture, a drawing of about 100 fish swimming this way and one fish swimming that way. The whole idea about going against the current. Someone who's not following what everybody else is doing. Someone who isn't letting society dictate to them how they should think and how they should live. And some people will have a hard time with that and won't understand you, but others, it will awaken in them a desire to find out what is it about you that gives you the ability to be able to swim against the current, to live this different way of life, to live this life that God has intended for us to live. Moses asks, what will distinguish us from the others on the face of the earth? We as a church ask the same thing. What will distinguish us from any other organization in Port Hope? Well, it's the presence of God. Finally, Moses comes to the big question that he asks of God. He's been assured by God that his presence will go with him and that God is pleased with him and found favor in him, with him. But now he asks one more thing. He says, Lord, show me your glory. He's received a lot from God. He's experienced God a lot. But even with that, he knows that there's more. He knows that there is more to know about God, more of God to experience, more of God to understand, more of God to impact his life and to change him. And he, sa he says to God, let me see all of you. Show me your glory. And a message of encouragement and challenge to us this morning, especially if we've been in the church for many years, is that when it comes to God, there's always more. You may have been a Christian for six months. You may have been a Christian for 60 years. You may have served him faithfully in many areas of the church and the community. You may pray and read his word regularly. You may have walked with God and experienced a lot of his blessing in your life. But like Moses, who knew God as a friend and yet asked for even more, there's always more. There's always more that we can know and understand and experience of God. To be honest, I know in my life sometimes I've shied away from asking for more from God. Sometimes I shied away from asking him to, to show me his glory because I was scared. 
scared of what he might do, scared of what he might ask me to do, scared perhaps that my life would be irrevocably changed if I saw God in a whole new way, but that's kind of actually the point. I know sometimes people shy away from asking God to see his glory because we kind of we pigeonhole those kind of experiences with certain denominations and certain segments of the church. But desiring more of God, asking to see his glory at work in our lives is not a, den a denomination thing. It's a Moses thing. It's a Bible thing. It's a Christian thing. So God, Moses asked God to show him his glory, to give him a glimpse of the totality of who God is. Moses' prayer to God let me see all of you. And what does God present to Moses in response to this prayer? Well, first God, it says, shows Moses his goodness. His goodness. He tells Moses, I will cause all of my goodness to pass in front of you. Now, to think of seeing all of God's glory can be quite an intimidating prospect. But the idea of seeing all of his goodness of being wrapped up completely in ultimate and eternal goodness. That's not really a scary prospect at all. Life can be a struggle at times. Situations can be stressful. People can be stressful. We need days like Thanksgiving Day last week to really stop and think about the things in life that are good. Sometimes good can be hard to find. But it's God's desire by showing us all that he is that he, we would be enveloped in his goodness. That we would know that his plans for us are good. That his blessings toward us are good. That the way he works in our lives for, is for our good and that it's an extension of his goodness. We were sharing before scripture verses and lines from him. is one of my favorite lines from any hymn is the line in the hymn, Blessed Assurance where it says that we are filled with his goodness and lost in his love. To me, that's the best description of what it means to experience God in all of his glory, filled with his goodness and lost in his love. To have his goodness and love wrap around us, protecting us from evil and harm and hate, filling us with a goodness and love that we can in turn share with others. So in response to the question, show me your glory, God tells Moses that first he will show him his goodness, and then says that God will proclaim his name. I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. Now one's name in scriptures is very significant. I mean, when we're named by our parents, there's oftentimes reasons why we're named the names we are. I have no idea where Jeff came from. There was no uncle or anything. Um, but sometimes there are purposes by our name. In the Old Testament, the names were really meant something. They, they were really connected with the person's character, primarily. The, the, the person's name and a person's character were intertwined. And when the Lord shows us his glory, he reveals to us his name, which means he reveals to us his character. He shows us who he really is. He does this through the scriptures, to be sure, but he also does it very personally through his presence, allowing us to experience the many aspects of his character, of, of who he is. There are people in the world who find it difficult to understand God. They find it hard for their finite human minds to wrap around the idea of a God who is just beyond us. But one of the most important things to know from the start, one of the foundations that we all need to know in terms of understanding God, is that he can be known. He, like Ruth said, he's a person. He has personality. He has character traits. He is not an impersonal force. He is not a made-up figment of some person's imagination. He is a God who can be known just as you know your spouse and your, your children and your parents and your best friend. He's a God whose presence can be experienced. That experience may not always be easy to define in words, but we need to understand that God is a God who can not just be known about, but can be known. Not just be learned about, but experienced. And as we experience him, we know him more, and we come to understand his personality, his character. 
So God tells Moses in response to his question, show me your glory, that he'll show Moses his goodness, he'll proclaim his name, and that he will display his mercy and compassion. The Lord says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. What enables us to experience God's presence, what enables us to know him as a friend, what enables us to even begin to understand him, is the fact that he has mercy on us, that he has compassion on us. Because we, like the people of Israel, can be stiff-necked and stubborn and unwilling to listen, wanting to do things my own way. But God, in his great mercy and compassion, he loves us to the extent that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In his mercy and compassion, God's made forgiveness available. He has made communication and connection with him even possible. We didn't initiate it. God did. And in his mercy and compassion, we can know God's presence. We can see his glory. A glory that's so incredible that Moses could not look at it directly. God knew that as a human, the full glory of God would <laughs> blow Moses away. It would be too much for him to take. So he made provision for Moses. He says in verse 20, 21, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. And when my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand. There's a line from a hymn. And I, until I have passed by. Then I will remo remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. There's a prevalent theme throughout the Old Testament. Everyone knew that no one could see God and live. And in the New Testament, Jesus changes things somewhat. He is fully God. He says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Yet his followers could still, his disciples could still look at him, look him in the face and not be afraid that they were going to die. They could look at Jesus and live. But in the time since the New Testament, in a very real sense, we cannot look at the face of Jesus and live. By that I mean live the way we used to live, live the way we lived before. When we look at the face of Jesus, when we ask to see God's glory, when we experience all that God has for us to experience, we, in effect, have to die. We can't live the way we lived before. His presence changes everything. And having experienced his presence, we now know that there is a different way to live. We know there's a better way to live. And, and that old way of living just begins to fade away and dies itself. Jesus instructed his followers, take up your cross and follow me. The cross is an instrument of death. We look at the cross as jewelry or decoration in a church, but it would be equivalent to, to the gallows or the electric chair today. In following Jesus and experiencing him, his goodness, his character, his mercy and compassion, our old, stubborn, stiff-necked way of life, our, way, our, our life of doing things our own way is put on the cross, is put to death, and a new, different, and better way of life takes its place. The Lord allowed Moses to see what few in his day had ever seen. He allowed Moses to see his glory. He allowed it because of Moses' desire to please God. He allowed it because of Moses being teachable, his willingness to listen, his willingness to obey, because of his desire to experience more of God than he had ever experienced up to that point. And I believe it's God's promise that he will show us more of himself more of his goodness, more of his character, more of his mercy and compassion, that he will show us his glory as we come to him with the attitude of Moses, with a humble heart, with a teachable heart, with a willingness to do things God's way. And when we approach God like this, we will know his presence. We will experience him. We will know his glory. Would you pray with me, please? Father, you offer us this ocean to drink from, and sometimes we content ourselves with a glass of water. We know there's so much more of you. And I pray, Lord, that we would be open to, to knowing more 
about you, to experiencing your goodness, to experiencing your glory, and to allow that to change our lives so that we may live the life that we were created to live. Lord, forgive us for the times when we're stubborn, the times when we're stiff-necked, the times when we try to do things our own way. Make us teachable. Make us humble. Help us to come to you with the attitude that Moses did and with a desire to want to know you more, to want to experience you more. Lord, thank you for all that you've shown us over the years, whether we've known you for a short time or a long time. Thank you for all we've experienced. Thank you for the goodness that you've shown us. We don't ask for more because we're ungrateful. We ask for more because there is so much more and you want us to experience more of you. Help us to know you more, to know your character, to know who you are. Let that character infuse who we are so we become more like you. Lord, may that be our prayer, that you would show us your glory, you would show us your goodness, we would show us all of who you are, and may that impact the way we live and the way we live before others. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Jesus shines brighter. Jesus shines purer than all the angels heaven can boast. Light is another demonstration of God's glory. Jesus wants to shine in our lives brighter than all the other things that might crowd him out, the other things that we think are important. He wants us to kind of lay them aside and come before him and, and humble ourselves before him and say, God, show me that light. Show me your glory. Show me who you are. This week, may that be our prayer, to humbly come before God and say, Lord, you show me so much, but I know there's more. Show me more of who you are. May God bless you this week. You could stay in here and visit with masks on. I hope the weather's nice visit outside. Again, board members just remind you.